So can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So my first question to you is, how much do you think you will remember in 24 hours from my presentation? And the next slide, 90%. Next slide, please. 90%. Do you think you will remember 90%? No one. Next slide, please. 75%. No one. <laughs> next slide. 50%. I hope that at least one of you. Okay, perfect. Next slide, please. 25, okay, and next one, 5%. <coughs> this is a question which I ask very often, and next slide, please. Which is a question which I ask very often to my students, our medical students, and then I show this slide, what is the average recall after 24 hours? And the fact is that if we are only listening, we will, you will remember 24 hours later only 5%. Next slide, please. If there's any chance that I can get it, it would help me tremendously. If we are discussing, it is about 50%. And the next slide. And the only person who really uh, takes advantage is myself, because if you teach others, then you remember 90%. So I always appreciate when I'm invited somewhere, because if I'm invited, I learn a lot myself. So this is the average recall every now and then I will ask you the questions and this is because I want you to remember much more than 5%. Okay, what are probiotics? You probably know there are many definitions of probiotics and one of them describes probiotics as live microorganisms which when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. And here are some examples. What, it, what are important? What is important is that all probiotics are not created equal, and that we have to evaluate each of the probiotics separately. And our focus today, our focus will be on Lactobacillus reuteri (DSM 17938). One is missing here, which is a daughter strain of another probiotic, Lactobacillus reuteri ATSS 55730. And you may ask yourself, do I need to know all these letters, all these numbers? And the answer is yes, because this is the identification of these strains. And all these letters means what is a microbiological culture depositions. And all these numbers mean under which number they are collected. So this is <coughs> extremely important, because we always have to speak about a specific probiotics. You always sometimes, you sometimes, and you also saw it in the title, you see other names, like for Lactobacillus reuteri, you can see Protectis. And what does it mean? It's a marketing trade name, and uh, these are not regulated, and companies can call their products, their product, probiotic products, as they want. And they often use it, but it's important to remember that for scientific purposes, we always need to know all these letters and all these numbers. So let me go back. I don't know why one letter, why one figure is missing, but it's DSM 17938, but for one reason or another, it's lost here. Anyway, it's a daughter strain of another probiotic, as I said, Lactobacillus reuteri ATSS 55730, <coughs> and it was originally isolated from breast milk of a Peruvian mother, but was found to carry potentially transfer resistant traits for tetracycline and lincomycin. This was dangerous, potentially dangerous, so this strain um, uh, was replaced by the daughter strain without unwanted plasmid-borne resistance. There is a lot of discussion, can two strains be regarded as equal, and there are some arguments in favor, in vitro studies showing similarities with regard to the chromosomal genes, colony and cell morphology, fermentation pattern, mucin binding, and reuter introduction. And there were another study showing no differences between strains in the characteristics of temporary colonization. On the other hand, there are some arguments again, like one in vitro study showing on Lactobacillus GG, it was not on this strain, that even the manufacturing process might influence properties of probiotic bacteria. We don't know what is the clinical significance, but in summary, there are arguments against and for considering this strain is equal. Is it important? Yes, it is important to know uh, whether they are equal, because if they are equal, and as I said, many people consider them equal, then we can use the data on the mother strain to support the data on the daughter strain. 
and every now and then I will be showing the data of the older strain and please keep in mind why I'm showing the and what is the question. What is the mechanism of action? We don't know exactly what is the mechanism of action of probiotics. There are many of them, both immunological and non-immunological. For non-immunological, one of the very well known for Lactobacillus reuteri is the production of reuterin. And for immunological, many of them, it's a, cyto, uh, a number of uh, cytokines which are maybe produced with mainly anti-inflammatory activities. But in principle, there are two main way mechanisms of action. I come from a country when there are so many probiotics being sold. You have seen we are, we are one of those countries with a lot of studies on probiotics. And in my country, people are always asking me, is it marketing or true benefit? And I like very much evidence-based medicine. And for those of you who are interested in evidence-based medicine, you know that there is a hierarchy of evidence for questions about the effectiveness of an intervention. So every now when you want to know the answer, what is the effectiveness of whatever intervention, including probiotics, the best way is to look at the, um, at the evidence, which is the strongest evidence, and this comes from randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. And this is exactly the kind of uh, studies which I would like to discuss uh, today when I will, um, will be um, talking about some of the um, uh, evidence on the use of Lactobacillus reuteri. Let me start with acute gastroenteritis. This is one of the best documented um, indications for the use of probiotics. And of course, the key management is of course rehydration, oral or intravenous rehydration and proper nutrition. However, the problem with the rehydration is that if we use oral rehydration solution, uh, it does not reduce the duration of diarrhea and does not reduce <coughs> the stool volume. So what I would like to present you now is a new position paper which comes from ESPEGAN. ESPEGAN stands for European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. And together with some of my colleagues, Flavia Intro is one of the co-authors of this paper. We work on, the, on this position paper, and uh, <clears throat> for this position paper, we uh, include in this position paper we included systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and three meta-analyses were performed specifically to assist the development of the guidelines, and we looked at subsequently published randomized controlled trials. We are only interested in children who were previously healthy with acute gastroenteritis, and we looked at uh, those studies in which probiotics were well defined and compared with placebo or no uh, probiotic. And the two outcome measures which are important for us was the stool volume and the duration of diarrhea, primary outcomes. Of course, we also look at the number of secondary outcomes, but this was the most important. As I told you, three meta-analyses were performed specifically to assist the development of these guidelines. And one of them is a meta-analysis of Lactobacillus reuteri strain DSM17938 and the original strain ATCC557380. And now you understand why we are looking at these strains uh, separately, but also in the same paper for treating acute gastroenteritis in children. Uh, for this particular strain, we identified five uh, randomized controlled trials, and part of every systematic review is that we look at the methodological quality of included trials. And as you can see on this, on this slide, the methodological trials was not, uh, not, equal, uh, not equal. Everything that is marked with green means that there is no risk of bias. Everything that is marked uh, red means that there is high risk of bias. And everything that is marked uh, yellow means that, is some, that there were some questions. So there were some methodological problems with some of the trials. Three trials were on lactobacillus on the mother strain, and two trials were on the new uh, of the daughter strain, Lactobacillus reuteri DSM 17938. Here are our major findings from this meta-analysis. So if you compare Lactobacillus reuteri 
uh, versus control, then you will see for this uh, daughter strain, there was a reduction in the duration of diarrhea, and the same for the mother strain. As you can see on this slide, we did not pull data on these two probiotic strains. We thought it's better to evaluate each one of them separately. But if you pull them, you will also see the reduced duration of diarrhea by approximately one day. We also looked, there were no studies which looked at the effect of Lactobacillus reuteri on stool volume. But there were studies which looked at the effect on the cure on day three, so there was increased chance on the cure on day three for both, uh, for this strain. This was a uh, difference which was almost statistically significant. And again, we did not pull the data from those two strains, but if you pull them, there was also an uh, increased chance for the cure on day three. So I showed you the data, the summary of data on Lactobacillus reuteri, and now I will have a question. Would you recommend probiotics, and in particular, this particular strain, Lactobacillus reuteri, DSM 17938, for the treatment of acute gastroenteritis in children? Now you can answer to yourself. I can hardly hear because I have problems after flying. So I will show you what, was, uh, what are the conclusions from the ESPEGAN working group on probiotics. We only make recommendations using the GRADE system where they were formulated in only if at least two randomized trials that use a given probiotics with a strain specification were available. For the Lactobacillus reuteri, that was true. So let, us, let me show what are the, our final conclusions. <coughs> We gave now uh, for this uh, position paper, we identified four probiotics with a positive recommendations. Like in previous our position paper, it was Lactobacillus GG and Saccharomyces boulardii. But what is new is Lactobacillus reuteri DSM 17938, and it's mainly based on the systematic review which I just showed you. And there is also in the guidelines Lactobacillus acidophilus LB, which is not typical probiotic because it's heat inactivated, so it's not, not live probiotic, but still because it's usually discussed in the context of the probiotic, that's why it is discussed, it, 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 it is in our position paper. So going back to the probiotics which we are discussed, this is something new when it comes to compared to previous guidelines, that Lactobacillus reuteri with a quality of evidence very low and weak recommendation, but it's now in the, as one of the probiotics which may be considered in, in the management of acute gastroenteritis, always in addition to rehydration, never to replace rehydration. So this what I showed you, it was a use of pro, uh, Lactobacillus reuteri for the treatment of acute gastroenteritis. Now I would like to discuss a little bit about the prevention of nosocomial diarrhea. If you are working in the pediatric department like myself, you know it's always a problem, nosocomial diarrhea. This comes from the meta-analysis that was published in pediatrics two years ago. 2.9, almost three incidents of mainly rotavirus gastroenteritis, nosocomial gastroenteritis per 100 hospitalization, and it's especially true for children younger than two years hospitalized during the epidemic months. 